Let's encourage him as he comes and brings the word this morning. appreciate that that was a good I told him that it was a good word it was on Esther anybody remember that sermon on Esther I hope you do it was a powerful word uh, uh, my brother Benny uh, made a really great compliment brother Josh about you the other day he said you know brother Josh always has a good word and he does it in 30 minutes and then my brother went on and said if you can't say it in 30 minutes Maybe you can't say it. So I don't know if he was telling me something or not. Because I, I always had a hard time saying it in 30 minutes. I always figured if you did it a little longer and doubtly you said something that stuck with them. But it is good. I, I love to see people that can really put it precise and get it in there and get it over it. And man, it's, it, it, it's good. Uh, but uh, it's so good to be here. And like uh, Pastor Steve said that I had mentioned about, felt like, uh, uh, just called him yesterday and said we were back in town. I know when somebody's traveling, you like to make sure that they are close by, and uh, at the last minute they don't show up, and you know, oh, I thought they were coming. But uh, anyway, I really feel, there's been a, only probably a couple times that I've ever felt this. Uh, one time it was in uh, Louisiana, uh, Leesville, Louisiana. And I felt I had a sermon specifically for that church. Now, there's good sermons, and sometimes I, I, I hesitate to call them generic, but they're, they're good any time for anybody, any place. But, uh, but I feel that the Lord impressed me with a word specifically for you folks. Say for me. Can you accept that? Now, I would love to talk to you about Ecuador and things, but I don't really want to take the time this morning. We've been missionaries 43 years, 28 in uh, Guatemala, part of that time, same time in Ecuador. Uh, we've been missionaries 43 years. Lord's doing great work, and we leave in just a few days, already have our tickets, leave in a few days to uh, go back to Ecuador. Uh, thank you for your uh, prayers, your offerings, and uh, we appreciate it so much. And so I do not get in trouble. My wife, Sandy, is here. It's the same one that was here last time. And it's, just, it's the same one that's been for 50 years, so might as well keep her, right? Uh, and uh, congratulations to uh, Brother Oscar, Sister Carling. How many years? 56 yesterday. 56 yesterday. Wow. Uh, and somebody else was having what? An anniversary birthday? Who? Debbie's birthday. Debbie's birthday today. And we won't talk about how many years that is, right, Sister Debbie? 21. Okay, 21. Still looking good for 21. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Exodus, the third chapter, and the seventh verse. Exodus 3, 7. I want to talk to you today about expanding your capacity. That sounds so simple, but yet it's so profound. You're on a journey. You're at this building. I understand you've bought land. Are you going to use it? you got to expand, don't you? And if you're going to expand physically, you got to expand spiritually. It's so easy physically. Boy, I love monocles. Anybody love monocles? Oh, it's easy to expand physically. But boy, that, that spiritually is another 
It's another dog to catch. It's a little harder. Okay, Exodus, the third chapter, the seventh verse. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of Egypt's, of the Egyptians and to bring them up of the land unto a good land and a large land, a land flowing with milk and honey and to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Parasites, and the Hittites, Hevites, and the Jebusites. Wow. The Lord has seen their cry. It's God speaking. When God's speaking, I think we ought to listen. He said, I've come down. I've heard your cry. He's heard their cry. And he tells them what he's going to do. And it is so interesting that God is working in their behalf while the whips are still on their backs. All right. mm -hmm. The whips are still on their back and God is in the midst of answering their prayer and they don't understand it. They don't hear, they don't know that God is already, while they're formulating their prayer, God is already talking to a man, Moses. I want to tell you today, if you've got a prayer out there, hold on. Hold on to that prayer. While you're formulating that prayer, God is already working in your behalf. That is, if you've prayed the right prayer. Now we've got to make sure we pray the right prayer. Any of you ever prayed the wrong prayer? Oh, I bet. All of us fellas, boy, we prayed for that, oh, that girl we were dating and going with. Man, we prayed, oh, Lord, it must be the one. Forty years later, we look and say, thank you, God, you didn't let that prayer go through. You filtered that one out. Got any witness, fellas? Some of you didn't raise your hand, and I know some of you. <laughs> but, but God filters out some of those prayers, but... If we are praying, God is hearing that prayer. He may say, yes, no, or wait. Right now, some of your prayers are in the wait stage. Do you know why? Give me one reason why. Timing. Timing is everything. All of you are anxious for another move of God, another step, another. But God, a lot of times, is waiting on us. We think we're ready. But he's got to increase our capacity. One of the first things that captivates me in this story, as I said, that God was already answering their prayer when they were still praying. They were still praying, and, and, and at the same time, God was working in their behalf with Moses. But he had to prepare them. He had to prepare those people that they were ready to leave. And I think part of that suffering made them ready to leave. Okay, let's go on and read uh, there. Where did I stop at? Verse uh, 9. Let's start. Okay, uh, verse 9. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come up unto me, and I have seen their oppression, wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Moses became the leader. And you know all the story, and we won't go into that, and how God prepared him and how he came and, and uh, 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 went to Pharaoh and all the plagues, and you know all that story. But I tell you, God was working in their behalf, and uh, I, I, you know... I was so captivated how God was working all the time that they were praying or uh, waiting and the whips are on their back. Then a second thing I was captivated uh, about that uh, God explained that he was going to give them a good land, a big land. But what did they do? They voted God down, didn't they? They voted him down. 
They stayed in the wilderness 40 years. Colossians 1.16 says that he has made all things and by him all things consist. He made every molecule of you. He made every cell of you and he knows your capacity. He, he's made you with a destiny in mind. He wants to take you from this place to another place. Sometimes a physical place, sometimes it's a spiritual move. And he wants to move us on up, on up in his kingdom and, and reaching out around this area and, and around the world physically. But sometimes, you know, we just vote God down. We say, oh, well, well God says, I've called you. I've called you. I've called you. Do you believe that everyone in this building is called? Oh, yes. Every one of you, from the least to the greatest, to the oldest, to the youngest, he's called every one of us to be a part. He's called you to be a part of this. And the thing is, he knows you. He bought you with his blood. He saved you. And he knows your hidden sins. He knows your open sins. He knows you and he still loves you. Right. And he's called you. And he's called you and sometimes we say, oh, but God. But God, I can't do it. Oh, I, I, I can't do that. Well, 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 do you know better than God? God's called you to be a part. And he, he's called you and he wants you to come up and increase your capacity to believe and do what he wants you to do. I just believe that he's called every one of us to be a part of his kingdom. And he's, if you're in this ch uh, church, he's called you to be a part, a partaker, not just a partaker to receive, but a partaker in all of the aspects of the ministry. God says you can do it. And I say, oh, 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 oh God, oh, God, you're good, but I don't know. Do you doubt God? God knows what you can do. And he's got great plans for this church and for you. God says, I am going to give you a promise and a future. And they say, we're going to stay right here. It is safer. I want, I want us to remember that there's no safer place than in the promises of God. He didn't say it wouldn't be scary. Sometimes it'll be scary. But right in the promises is where in the, he will direct us, protect us, and provide for us. You know, there's no higher frustration than being out of the perfect will of God, out of doing what he wants us to do. Let us let our capacity expand. You know, sometimes we just don't claim everything that God has for us. It's kind of like sometimes in the wintertime, we don't have these down in Texas, uh, uh, in uh, Ecuador because uh, it doesn't get all that cold. But up north, you know, you go to a fine restaurant and you go in and they got these coat racks and, and you check in a coat and a hat and uh, you, you put it there and some, uh, some of those places uh, you, you get a claim check. And uh, after you've eaten, you go back and uh, you pick up that uh, coat. And, uh, but you forgot, you slipped out the door and it's freezing cold out there. And, oh, you're, you're just shivering. And you say, oh, I got a coat in there. Oh, but I'm not going to go get the coat. I'm not going to claim it. Well, now, why wouldn't you claim it? You're outside, freezing to death, shivering, and you may die, and you got a coat in there with a claim check. It's got your name on it. It says, brother so-and-so, got your name on it. You know the number. And you say, oh, I'm just going to go out here and freeze to death. You know, that's what we do with God sometimes. We got a claim check, and it's got your name on it, but sometimes we just don't claim what God has uh, for us. I'm also captivated by the view of the facts of Joshua and Caleb and God and then the other spies. Wow, what a difference. Turn with me to Numbers 13. Numbers 13, and let's start reading with verse 25. Numbers 13, 25. And they returned from searching of the land, talking about the spies, after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation. 
That's kind of what I'm doing today. I'm bringing you a story to the congregation of there's a future for you. There's a land. There's a place. In this case, you've got a land. You just need a building on the land. But I'm bringing you a word to the congregation that God's got planned for you. And they went and came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh and brought back forth unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. And the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the people of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. And the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. Wow. God told them who was there. Did God, does God know that the enemy's out there? God wasn't surprised, was he? God knew the enemy was out there, but what did he say? They're there, but the land's yours. They're there, but the land's yours. And then on top of that, they brought back some fruit. He said, here, we got some grapes. You want to taste these grapes? Taste these grapes. That, that's what's out there on the other side. They, there's grapes. Now, where these grapes are, oh, there's pomegranates, oh, there's all kinds of crops, there's all kinds of animals and all of that. But now we can eat the grapes today. You want, you want to enjoy some of the grapes today? We'll, we'll eat some of them today. Like, we, whoa, we worship here today. That was good. That was good. But uh, you, you just, but these grapes are only enough for you and I, three or four more today. But now... If you want to eat these grapes every day, oh, you, you got to step across. You got to go. You got to go someplace. Now you can have the grapes today, and you can wish for all the animals and all of that, or you can look at all the enemies. All the enemies are there. But what did God say? God says, "I'm going to give it to you." He said, "I'm going to give it." To you. They're there, but he's going to give it to them. Now, well, there's a time period. You got to do something. So they're 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 thinking about, oh, I don't know. They think, well, I'd like to, but all those ites are there. You know, the Hittites, Jebusites, all those ites are there. And I just don't think I want to go there. So he says, fine, take a lap. So they take a lap. And, and, and you know, you, you know the story. They take a lap. This lap is equal one year. And they come back around and they take more laps. And uh, God's wanting to move them into the promised land. But oh, Boy, the enemy's over there. Oh, yeah, yeah, he, he's out there. You realize he's out there? Oh, yeah, he's out there working. Uh, yeah, he's out there. Let's read ver uh, verse 30. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men, oh, why didn't it stop at verse 30? But it didn't. But the men that went up with him said, We're not able. We be not able to go up against people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report. Good people. Israelite people. You think they were good people? Oh, these good people. But they brought up an evil report. Because they saw a different side. They, they, they saw it different. Same land, same fruit, same trip. I can go through 
the countryside like coming here today. And I see it different than you do. I see it beautiful, the corn, the beans. I, I, I look through the fields, no weeds. See, when I was a boy living here, you always had butter prints. You always had stuff out in the beans. And you had to go out there and cut them and all that stuff. And, uh, but, but now these chemicals. But I, I was looking and I saw one field and it had some weeds. So I thought, oh, oh the farmer missed some stuff there. But, but you go through the field and you probably don't think anything about going through the countryside. But see, I go through there and not living here and I see the beauty of it. But these people, they saw it different. Some of them saw it different. And they brought up this evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land which we have gone to search it out is a land that eateth up the inhabitants. Therefore, in all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw giants of the son of Anak which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight, oh, as grasshoppers, and we were in their sight as grasshoppers. Now, I've got some questions for you. Do you think God knew that the giants were there? Oh, yeah. He knew. Now, do you think the Canaanites told them you're grasshoppers, we're giants? I don't think so. Where'd they get that evil report? In their mind, their imagination. All oh, that mind gets to going and you imagine. Somebody in church after church is talking. Two dear sisters are talking. You, I bet you they're talking about me. Are you that important they be talking about you? But... But that imagination gets going. Oh, it gets going. And, and they're not talking about you. They're talking about, is there church tonight? Yeah, yeah, it's church tonight, but that other Sunday night, it's not church. And, and did you understand all those announcements and all that? But that imagination gets wild. They said, we are giants in their eyes, and we're, and, I mean, we're grasshoppers in our eyes and their eyes. Now, they had come down, they, somehow they come to the conclusion, they thought they were talking about them as grasshoppers. And then they started, they came convinced they were grasshoppers in their own sight. Convinced themselves. Wow. They thought they were grasshoppers. And God says, I'm going to send you in. I'm going to send you in. Now, did he say that they would have to go in and fight? Immediately? Did he say, go, go, go kill all those guys immediately? No. What, what did he tell them? He said, I'm going to give you the land. And you got to take it. Now, someplace between God's give and our taking, boy, we, we got to look up it in a different dictionary. God's got one dictionary and, and we've got another. God says, you take it. Now, now, how were they to take that land? They marched around. God said, go in and take the land. Now, they tell me from Egypt to the promised land should have been, what, eight days, nine days. I, I hear different numbers, but eight, nine days. Say ten days. Well, it took 40 years. They didn't understand take. All they had to do was walk. Just walk. Just walk. That's all they had to do. Didn't they walk through the wilderness? Didn't they walk through the Jordan River that God opened? Didn't they walk around Jericho? Did they fight at Jericho? No. They just walked around Jericho. Now, did they have to fight? No, not, not until they got an army. God didn't expect them to fight until they had an army. He does not expect you to do what you cannot do. But he expects you to do what you can do. It was walk. That's all he required of them is walk. And they decided they're going to stay in the wilderness for 40 years. Can't you imagine Caleb and Joshua? 
Oh man, it gets 35 years. They've, they, 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 they've, been, they've, they've been walking. And you know, one day a head elder, he calls a meeting. And can't you imagine Caleb and Joshua? Oh man, I hope it's this year. I hope it's this year that our leaders say, we're going to take the land. But they call the meeting, and they're so disappointed. The held elder says, we're going to talk about tonight how savory the garlic was in Egypt. (laughs) And God says, walk another year. Walk another year. Every one of those spies could have gone in. How many went in? Two. The others died in the wilderness. Not because they could not go in, because of their unbelief, their capacity. How is your capacity? How is your capacity? I I want my capacity to grow. I mean, when I look back, some of the things, I I, I can see it growing. This message is for all of us. It's for me. I want my capacity to grow. I I can see it growing. I I, I can see it different times. Uh, Sandy is very more sensitive. A lot of times women are. But Sandy's more sensitive to some of the things than, than I am. And she'll say, no, we need to give more on that. I'll, I'll say something, and she'll say, no. And, and any time she says that, I know to listen. I, I never question it. Well, the same way if I say something, she never questions that either about something like that. But uh, I will say uh, uh, about giving, and, uh, but, but she'll say it, and, I, uh, and sometimes she'll say, no, we need, we need to do more than that. Because I want my, compa- my capacity to be expanded to grow. The spies chose to believe that they looked like grasshoppers in the eyes of the Canaanites. No one from Canaan, I don't believe, ever told them that. But they believed what they thought others saw them. Never believe what you think maybe others see in you. If you think you can't, you can. But if you think you can, you can. Never get that negative thing in you that if you think you can't, think you're too small. And we speak our own demise sometimes because our, our, our background, uh, our upbringing, whatever, uh, the size of our church. and Never think, oh, well, we're not as big as this other one or whatever. God looks at us as individuals and where he's put us, our location. I tell you, it, it's tremendous to see what God can do if we allow him. I, I, I'm trying to stretch my capacity. I want him to stretch me. Just recently, a few weeks ago, uh, Sandy and I were getting ready to go to a missions conference over in Louisiana. And, uh, and uh, she said to me, she says, oh, Jerry, remember the checkbook. Now, one could think, I'm a missionary going to a missionary conference. Why do I need a checkbook? I'm going to a missions conference. But we know that you must sow seed if you're going to reap a harvest. So I put the checkbook in, and we got over there, and the church was, uh, sure, it was a missionary conference, so they uh, took up different offerings, but they were taking up an offering. And I... Uh, leaned over to Sandy, and I said, I was thinking $300. And she says, that's what I was thinking. Now, this is a missionary conference, but I stood there and I thought, wow, I wish I had 10 times that much to sow into those other 30, 40 missionaries that were there. I don't say that bragging. I I, I wish I had 500. I wish I had 1,000 to put in. But we put that in and sowed seed. And that church raised 130000 in cash and pledges in two and a half days of conference. Did I tell you they were just common folk? No, 
No millionaire, no billionaire, just common folk. Oh, did I tell you it's a church of, of about 120 people, wow. counting probably children and all? I said they raised 130000 I'm almost sure they will give more than that during the year. Now, they could have said, we're so small. Oh, oh, they have a school there, too. It's a military base close by, and they have a school there that people just really want to send their kids to. They get calls from Germany and all over when the military guys are coming back or to that station, and they have a school reaching out to the community. But, but I thought, oh, wow. If I could just sow into those missionaries, leaving there, going all over the world, wouldn't it be great one day to stand before the Lord and say, wow, maybe I had a little bit of all the souls there from around the world. Wow, what a day it's going to be. I remember back in 1983, I was in Amsterdam, invited by the Billy Graham Association when they had evangelists and people from all around the world, and I was selected as one from Guatemala. I remember standing in that place, and I can still see it, sense it, feel it, standing there with 5,000 people of every nation of the world. Wow. It was many heaven. All see the different ones with their outfits on from the different nations. But what a day it's going to be when we stand before him and everything we've done for his kingdom, it's going to be worth it. You know, it's not going to matter at that point how big of a house did you have, how big of a car did you have, how much money you left in your bank account. One thing, what I gave you, what did you do with it? Oh, I want to be faithful and give everything. And, some, and, and, and I don't say these things uh, uh, to brag. I just I want to show you, uh, uh, make a point. Another place, hi, sweetheart. We were at another uh, place, and uh, 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 no, we weren't at another place. I, uh, I received information uh, about a, a work in Nepal. And uh, uh, they're doing a great work over there, and there's so much need in Nepal. And uh, I sent this, uh, this brother a check for $100 the other day, and I said, Oh, brother, I wish I could do more. I know the need is great. I've read the things. I know the things. I know the country. I know the need there. And I said, Oh, I wish I could give so much more. And I said, uh, in, in Ecuador, uh, still so much need and everything there. But I tell you, it's such a blessing when you can touch uh, lives around the world. Well, if I could catch up with my notes. I'm not a good note guy, Brother Josh. See, I have to have notes. If I don't have notes, I'm in trouble. And if I have notes, I'm in trouble. Because your notes get ahead of you or you get ahead of your notes. You, I, I know you don't have that trouble, Brother, brother Josh, because uh, you're good. You're good, yeah. Uh, you know, oh, uh, yeah. Have, you know, have you, ever seen, have you ever seen somebody move into a new, new house? We're talking about capacity tonight, today. Have you ever seen somebody move into a house, maybe not a new house, but a nice house, and, and, and they move in there, and you go by six months later, eight months later, ten months later, and it looks like a bomb went off. No, a bomb didn't go off. You know, they got a car jacked up in, in, in the grass. Well, where there was grass, there's no grass. The screen door's hanging off, you know, and everything. We've got a neighbor like that. Not quite that bad, but pretty bad. Several years ago, they were moving in, and I was talking to him. You know, you try to be nice, talk to new neighbors, and I was talking to him. He said, we just moved out of an apartment, and he's, and he's got two kids, and he said, 
I'm not real good with yards. Well, brother, go back to apartment. <laughs> oh, he wants a house, but he doesn't have the capacity to have a house. See, 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 some people want things, but how is your capacity? Oh, no, 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 his, his house, his, oh, it was a nice home when he moved in. The people that lived there before were two elderly ladies. Well, elderly lady and her, her daughter. Oh, they kept it up, they kept it painted, and they were older, and they kept it up. They wasn't even a man, and they, and they kept it up. Oh, oh he's, got, he's got gutters there that, that the dirt blows in and the leaves get in. He's got plants coming out of his gutter. He didn't have to plant a garden. I, I, I mean, you know, your capacity. You know, God wants to expand our capacity. But if you're going to move up, you got to expand your capacity to move up. God wants us to move up. But sometimes people don't have the capacity to move up. And that's why I'm talking to you today. Because if you're going to move on up, you have to increase your capacity for those things. Now, how many of you want this church to grow? Uh, we're taking the vote. <laughs> I, I, well, okay, be honest, I should say. We're taking the vote, but be honest. See, some people don't want the church to grow, Brother Steve. You know, some people don't like people. Some people don't like other people, but some people just don't like people. And, and, and you know, you want to grow. But, but you know what, Brother Steve? When, when you get a building out there, you may not be able to afford a plush, plush church that'll hold 700 people with carpet, with all of this and all of the fine things that some churches have. All the fine. You may have a cement floor. You, you know our church in Houston, Texas that we go to, Pasadena? It's nice inside. Don't get me wrong, it's nice. But it's a metal building that they made very nice. Very nice. But, but I've seen churches you go into, they had carpet down the middle and everything is cement. Now some people would say, oh, Brother Steve, oh, I like this carpet. Wow, this is nice. Boy, I like these pews. Oh, oh this stained glass, I love that with the dove. But, but God may move you to a building that will hold 700 people instead of a couple hundred. What's it all about? Is it about stained glass window, nice carpet, nice pew? Or is it about people? What's your capacity? What's your capacity? What, what are you wanting? Yes, God may give you plush, plush. Oh, that'd be beautiful. I, I think God can do it. He, he, he can give you plush, but he may not. Oh, oh you, you may have just a keyboard. Well, that'd be all, for, all right, wouldn't it, Brother Josh? <laughs> he can do it. That, that'd be fine. He can do it. But you may not have room for everything at first. It, it, you, there may be changes. Can you handle change? You know, you know God wants to expand us. God, and, and you know sometimes things expensive, doesn't, they don't have to be expensive. Not this suit, but a suit almost, well, it's a different color, but a little striped. The other day, well, a few weeks ago, really, a few weeks ago, I told Sandy, I said, I need a new suit. And, of course, being a missionary, I thought, where should I go? Well, sure, K and G, that's where... Poor folks go. Well, it's a nice place, but it's, it's discounted and all that. And I thought I'll go to K&G. Well, I went over to K&G, and boy, the guy that was tending to me wasn't great. And, and I just didn't see what I wanted. So, you know, I, I'm thinking, you know, missionary, you think missionary ways. Sandy says, why don't we go to Macy's? Anybody know Macy's? She said, why don't you go to Macy's? I said, yeah, I've got a brochure. I've got a flyer from Macy's. I'd already looked at it. 
Yeah, I said they've got $650 suits on sale for $350. Well, if you had a coupon, you'd get a little more off than that. You know, you get a 10%, 20%. I, I said, yeah, I said, but right here, they, they got a section, name of some suit I didn't recognize, but I knew it was Macy's, so it's probably a good suit. And it was for $270, $280. So I, we were out at the mall. I said, well, yeah, let's just stop in and look. So I went over, and they were having this sale. And uh, there were four or five of them in the suit department, which usually not that many, but they were having this sale. So I started talking. I saw this lady, and this lady came right up, and it was three or four guys there. And this lady said, can I help you? I said, where's these suits at for, well, no, they were, they, they were 180 or something like that, in that. She said, oh, they're right here. They got all these hundreds of suits, <laughs> two colors, three sizes. I, no, I don't, you know, that's not what I need. But I said, show me something under $200. I don't even want to start there. Under $200 and 42 long. She has this whole rack over there on the wall. Oh, man, 42 long. She goes, she says, I think we've got one over here. And she goes down, she, they're not marked. She goes down, she pulls out one. She says, I think this one's on sale. She said, the guys don't even know probably this is on sale, but it's on sale. <laughs> she takes it over. She runs it through the scanner. She says, yeah, th this is on sale. She said, uh, this is a $650 suit, but it's 127 she said, the guys probably don't even know that this is on sale, but I, I had seen it and checked it. Well, the Lord was saving it for me. It wasn't marked. It probably been sold out of all those suits. It wasn't marked. So, so, but I'm not done yet. So she takes it and scans it, says 127. Oh, well, I go in and I try it on, and, and I need about a 35 waist. Uh, 34 is just too tight, you know. And 36 sometimes just a little... Right now, I probably feel just right, but usually it's a little big. But anyway, uh, it was 35. That's just what I wanted. So I go out and tell her I'll take it. She goes and uh, she and, and Sandy gets out her coupons. Uh, it's coupon Sandy. Uh, she's got her coupons, 10% off. Well, some things 20 bit suits, whatever, $10 or 10%. She had a $10. And the lady said, Oh, by the way, uh, we got to hem up the pants, but when do you need them? She said, do you need them right away? I said, no, 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 it's not for something special. I said, I don't need them for a while. Uh, she said, oh, well, if we could schedule it for next week, I could sell it to you as a pre-buy. I said, that's fine. So she, she does the discount. It goes from 127 to 97 Now, now, sometimes somebody will say, Oh, brother Steve, Pastor Steve, you look nice. But I bet you he did. I know, I know, brother Steve, he, he's trained well. I bet you he didn't pay top dollar for it. You, you don't either, do you, brother Josh? <laughs> you know, why pay top dollar? Get it on sale and ask for God's blessing. Right. You know, I'm trying to learn to walk in a new capacity. Yes. God's blessing. Right. You know, our pastor... He, he's blessed. We kid him. Oh, by the way, he's called Coupon Pastor Ron because he always uses coupons to go out and eat and stuff. But he's blessed. We kid him. We go out to eat, not, not with somebody in the restaurant, big restaurant, somebody on the other side pays his bill. And, and, and the waiter comes and says, Pat, uh, you... Somebody else paid your bill. He said, who? He didn't even know anybody else. Somebody over there. Oh, but that's little stuff. He'll go to the donut shop down the road, and he'll give, he'll buy donuts for the homeless people. And then he prayed. Oh, don't ever pray a prayer that you don't mean because God may answer he prayed that God would increase our church, bring in the homeless or whoever. He came back 
one day from lunch, sitting on the curb outside, is a homeless man. Pastor Ron looked at him, thought, I'm busy. I got work to do. Then he thought, I prayed. And you know what? That homeless man started coming to our church. You, you want your church to grow? It won't be easy. Everybody won't be happy. There's there some people, you know, get, get a little bit honorary. You know, they want everybody to go to heaven, just don't go from my church. I want you to go to heaven, but, you know, do I have to sit by you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I want everybody to go to heaven. Oh, you know, missionaries can have that problem. Oh, we can go to South America and win souls, and but sometimes we got to deal with you. No, no, but Pastor Ron's blessed. We kid him. We say, Pastor Ron, if something happened, he'll say, I'm blessed. So I'd like to be around him because I want to be blessed. But it costs you something. Some people from Belize came to our church a few years ago. And uh, Pastor Ron gave them his van. You ever given away a vehicle? I mean, a good vehicle. Some of it I know you give away to the junkyard for $20, but I mean, give away. He, he, he gave away. So he's blessed. God's blessed him. I, I could tell you story after story of different people that I know. If, if you get into giving, are you a giver or a taker? Oh, I want to be a giver. Oh, man, I, I, I don't want my hand out stretched all the time like that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I need that. But, but don't just hold on. I, I, I want to bless people. Boy, that, that you can bless them. Uh, and uh, Pastor Ron uh, uh, was talking to a dealer in our church, and uh, not a dealer but a salesperson, and he went out to this dealership uh, to pick up uh, a car. And uh, a fellow was trading in a nice Suburban. They'd already told him how many miles, what it was, everything. He's going to buy a used one. So he went out there, and the sales guy said, I'm so sorry. The guy that was going to trade it in backed out and didn't trade the car in. So Pastor Ron was very disappointed in that. But the salesman talked to the owner, and the owner said, we promised him that car. Give him a new one for the used price blessed. Do you want to be blessed? But do you have the capacity to receive? See, you got to be a giver to receive. It's a two-way street. See, you give to this church. You give to that building fund. You give to missions. You give the money to keep this operating. God blesses you. But it's in proportion to God's blessing proportion to our giving. How's your capacity? Now there's times that we need help. There's times that people desperately need help. And we're not talking about that. We're talking about people that's working and got jobs. But start where you are. Stop, don't rob God. Pay your tithes. Give your offerings. Don't rob God. I call it just like it is. The Bible says rob. Is that a good word? That's what the Bible says. It's a bad thing, but a good word. Because that's what God says. Let's turn to Hebrews. Hebrews, uh, the third chapter. And verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost said, hey, the Holy Spirit is saying here, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the day of provocation. Now, that's King James, but really in other translation, I like it better. It says rebellion. In the day of temptation or trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. They saw God's work 40 years. Now, what works did they see for 40 years? 
They saw for 40 years manna coming out of heaven. They got so used to that manna coming out of heaven, they saw for 40 years the clouds by day that cooled them. They saw by night the clouds that, that kept them warm. And they got water from the rock. And they got so custom to the miraculous of God that they took it. We're okay. Never get to the point you think miracles happening all around, I'm okay. We've got to make sure we're okay and, and, and maybe somebody else is okay, but am I okay? We need to make sure that we are okay. When our fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years, wherefore was I grieved? God was angry 40 years. That word grieved in some of the translations says angry. I, 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 can you imagine God being angry with you for 40 years? Any of you got a wife that's been angry with you for a day? Seemed like 40 years, doesn't it? <laughs> but, but can you imagine God was angry? And you know what? God was angry with them, and they didn't even halfway know God was angry with them. They thought God is still giving me manna, hadn't killed me. Sometimes we misinterpret that if God hadn't whipped me today that I'm okay. You know, God's grace and love, it's so, it's so great. And, 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 he, and he watches over us, and he continues to feed us, even sometimes when we're not doing what we should. But for 40 years, they got the manna, they had the clouds, they got the water, but God was angry with them. Oh, can't you imagine as they walk around, and, and, and they would come another year to that entrance, they would, could cross over the river and go in. And, and they'd come up there and think, oh, yeah, maybe, maybe this time. Oh, no, I don't think I can. I don't think I can. So they go around another time. For 40 years, God is trying to get them to move into the land. Boy, I hope it, our heads are not as strong as that. You know, but I chose this. I mean, starting out, I, I see us in that. You, you know, it's so easy for us to sit here in 2013 and say, oh, those Israelites, boy, how hard-headed they were. Boy, they were so hard-headed. Man, if boy, if God say he'd give me the land, man, with milk and honey, I'd be right there. Would you? Would you? God will promise you something uh, uh, today, tomorrow, next week, and, and, and we question it five times. God wants to give us so much more. Oh, you give us the desires of our heart. Not, not to heap it on ourselves. Oh, giving is to give. Oh, give to others. Help others. Help the work of the Lord. Help others in need. What is your personal territory? What is your spiritual territory? What is territory of this church? The territory of this church, is it this building? Is it a block around? Is it Lincoln? For sure it's Lincoln. But really through missions, it's all over the world. But we need to take our personal territory, our spiritual territory. Now sometimes that, that gets hard. But we've got to walk in our, our personal uh, 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 territory. I mean, I mean, we got to walk into our children's bedroom and we pray over those kids. They're asleep, uh, whatever, or, or when they're awake, pray with them. When they're asleep, pray over them. And say, you devil in hell, you're not going to take my kids. They're my kids. This is my house. It's my place. They're my kids. And I don't give them up to you. Amen. We need to claim the territory of God. Give us the capacity to claim this city. Give us the capacity to move and do what you want us to do, Lord. We need to increase our capacity. When your fathers tempted me and proved me, saw my works 40 years, wherefore I was grieved with this generation, said they do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Can you believe that? 40 years, and God says, they have not known my ways. You know what they had known? They had known God's manna. 
They had known God's clouds. They had known his protection. They had known his giving of food. But they had not known God. Oh, if we could know God's heart. Oh, if we could know what he wants for this city. Oh, if we could know what he wants for our family, our church, our people. Oh, to know him. To know him. Oh, I want to know him. Do you want to know him today? Know him in the fellowship of his suffering. To know him in all the ways that he wants us to go. Hallelujah. Oh, let's not be like the children of Israel. Get our little song up. Going around in a circle. Hallelujah. Going around a second time. Hallelujah. Oh, we think we're having church. Some people are, but some people aren't. Some people are participating. You ever been in church and in front? Haven't done this recently. You watch some people. The Lord's moving, everybody worship. Participation. Worshiping God. Yeah. Let's, let's worship the Lord. Let's do our part. Let's drop on down to verse 16. For some when they had heard did provoke, albeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved, angry, forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcass fell in the wilderness? Oh, to die in the wilderness. I don't want to die in the wilderness, and I don't want my children to die in the wilderness. I want to take them with me to the promised land. I'm not talking about heaven. I'm talking about the promised land, the promises right now that God's got for us. You know, we, we can talk about the promised land or we can talk about heaven and everybody wants to go there. But you, we got to do some things to get there. We need to expand our capacity. Would you stand with me? Josh, would you come play, please? Would you close your eyes, bow your heads? I want to ask you this morning, are you serious about expanding your capacity? I want God to give me more than manna. I just don't want to have to depend on daily manna. I want Him to bless me so I can bless others. I want Him to bless me so I can go and tell the good news. We've got to do something beyond ourselves. Are you willing, with the help of the Holy Spirit, to let the Holy Spirit do a drastic operation on your heart to expand you. If you're here and you think that you don't need an expansion, wow, that must be tremendous. I know I need to be expanded. Don't let fear, what others think, doubt, or others talk you out of it. But let God expand your capacity. Will you enter your promised land? Will you step out and sign right now this morning and come forward here, all of you, as we agree together for Lord to expand us? Come right up here front.